there we go. Okay. Um, so welcome everybody. My name is Bianca Perla. And once now that we're starting, if you would be able to turn off your videos on your screen and make sure you're muted, that would be great. Um, welcome to Living Waters Salmon Flash Talks. Uh, thanks for coming and I, I will be coordinating tonight and um, doing the shifts between the different speakers and also coordinating the, the Q&A and I'm really looking forward to these talks. I just got a preview of them before we let everybody in the room and they're going to be great. Um, so thank you all you speakers that have come tonight. Um, I um, The tribal nations have been and continue to be longstanding leaders in salmon stewardship in the Pacific Northwest. And I was planning to open with a land acknowledgement tonight, but we just learned that there has been a request by many of the Washington tribes through the Washington State Office of Indian Policy to pause reading land acknowledgements for now. And so we will be honoring that wish as we await more guidance from them. This panel um, is the first in the Living Waters series of events. It, this is a partnership with uh, Vashon Nature Center, Vashon Center for the Arts, Vashon Heritage Museum, the Natural History Museum, and it's funded in part by the Rose Foundation and Puget Sound Keeper Alliance. We have a lot of really exciting events happening after these talks and um, I, some of you, if, if you're connected with the local fifth graders, know that um, yesterday the fifth grade installed these beautiful salmon in Heron Meadow, which is the wetland that's right to the east of Vashon Center for the Arts. So you guys can go there anytime and see these. This was part of a joint project of Vashon Nature Center scientists and schools where we taught the kids about ecology and conservation of salmon. And then um, the Vashon Center for the Arts artists in schools program where Britt Frieda was uh, the, the artist that helped these um, kids make these beautiful salmon and talk about the life cycle as they were doing it. These are, are, are painted on carved or um, cut out salmon from cedar that Hans Nielsen cut out for us. So tomorrow, Britt Frieda is going to be running a workshop called Paint for a Purpose from 2 to 3.30 p.m. And anybody who wants to can show up at VCA and paint salmon, their own salmon. And these will be installed either at, at the Heron Meadow or at the Heritage Museum to be part of the upcoming natural history exhibit. And those places also happen to be in the headwaters of our two most abundant salmon bearing creeks, Judd Creek and Shingamo Creek. So they're, they're going to be put there as a testament to our commitment and our love for our local salmon. So you can register at VCA's website for that if you would like to join us tomorrow. And there you can also donate um, to this talk, um, which helps us get more support for, for more quality talks in the future. And Wendy's gonna put something in the chat for that too, um, in case it's easier to just click on that link. So here's how it's going to work tonight. Uh, we have we have some speakers that will go in sequence. Each speaker is going to talk for about 10 minutes on their topic. Please mute yourself and turn off your screen if you can. Um, so for the um, for the presentation, so we can all focus on the speaker and we can focus on their slides. If you have questions, um, either write it down to yourself and wait for the end, or you can type it in chat and we will get to it after all the speakers have gone. Um, so we'll do a Q&A session right at the end and we'll, we'll um, call on people. Then I also have some um, great questions from the fifth graders uh, that they asked us to pass on to the different speakers tonight. So I'll probably pepper those in amongst your questions too. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing here while we get the first speakers up. Um, so salmon that we're talking about tonight are tied to many different ecosystems in the Pacific Northwest and from streams to forests to the ocean. And so we're going to cover all of those tonight. They give benefits to at least 137 species, including us. 
and they depend on many different habitats. So, so when we're talking about conserving salmon, we have to look at many different scales, many different parts of their life cycle and where they are during those parts of their life cycle. And it's very complicated. So the speakers here today are each contributing to salmon health in different ways. Some work on habitats and streams, others work on pollution, others work on dams and more regional issues. And they work on solving impacts at different parts of the salmon life cycle and, and at different scales across the landscape. So I'm really looking forward to these presentations. Unfortunately, our first planned speaker, Angela Dillon, has gotten sick, so she can't join us tonight. So think good healing thoughts for her as we go forward. So we will be starting with the second panelists on the list, and those are Stephanie Blair and Chelsea Mitchell. And they're going to be talking to us about stormwater runoff and what's in it and why is it um, is it a problem for salmon and what can we do to clean it and so um, Stephanie is a PhD candidate in the School of Environment at Washington State University's Puyallup Research and Extension Center and she investigates the lethal and sublethal biological effects in salmon um, of these that are exposed to these different urban runoffs and pollutants. And Chelsea Mitchell is a PhD candidate and research assistant who studies low impact development and at U Washington State University's Puyallup Research and Extension Center. So her research focuses on the understanding and improving of contaminant removal. So she's looking at green technologies such as bioretention and permeable pavements and trying to figure out how do we get the stuff that Stephanie is studying and finding out is, is impacting salmon? How do we get it out of the water? So they're gonna do a, a combined presentation here together about that. All right, so I'm gonna turn off my screen and let you guys um, go ahead and start. Stephanie, take it away. Thanks, Bianca. And thank you everyone uh, for inviting us to come share and talk about our research. Um, so the phenomenon of coho pre-spawn mortalities, we now refer to as coho salmon urban runoff mortality syndrome, uh, since we know that it's caused from a very specific chemical in tires, which I'll talk about today. So I'm working with my advisor, Dr. Jennifer McIntyre, looking at the toxicology behind these chemicals that end up in urban stormwater and in our urban creeks and how they affect salmon. So our built environments have fundamentally changed the way that water moves on the land. Stormwater is a word that we use to describe the negative consequences of those changes, such as an increase in surface runoff and pollutants. And this gets worse with increasing development. Pollutants collect on roadways from many sources, such as vehicles or runoff from lawns and from roofs. And some of these pollutants we're used to seeing on roadways, such as motor oil slicks, but there are many pollutants we don't see, such as pesticides or brake pad and tire wear particles. And although stormwater is directed to wastewater treatment plants, much of the stormwater is actually discharged directly into local surface waters untreated. We know that Chinook and Coho salmon abundances have been in decline in the Salish Sea for several decades. Stormwater runoff is the number one source of pollutants in the Puget Sound. Therefore, improving stormwater management is going to be critical to reverse these declines. Coho urban runoff mortality syndrome began to be recognized in the 1990s when coho salmon were found dying in urban streams in the Seattle area and streams that had been restored as salmon habitat. Forensic studies conducted by NOAA, our collaborators, uh, found that the coho were not dying from any known cause of fish mortality, but the die-offs occurred following rainfall events, which implicated unknown stormwater pollutants as the cause. Pre-spawn mortality rates in these streams continue to be exceptionally high. So shown here is a several creeks around the Seattle area, Longfellow Creek for a couple of years, Des Moines Creek, Piper's Creek, Pre-spawn mortality rates here are between 63 and 100%, which is striking compared to the non-urban site at Fortson Creek to the far right of this figure, where we know that pre-spawn mortality rates should be less than 1%. Based on population modeling, we know that 
pre-spawn mortality rates above 10% put coho populations at risk of extinction. Our partners at NOAA and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service conducted a landscape analysis of the Puget Sound Basin, and they found factors such as traffic intensity, road density, and urbanization were strong predictors of coho pre-spawn mortality risk, which did implicate vehicles as a potential source. When these landscape characteristics are tracked across the basin, we see watersheds in yellow and red where coho are at risk of extinction. Even in Vashon Island, we see some of um, the development area covered in yellow there. So these studies highlight the need for stormwater management, not just in city centers, but also in suburbs and in rural areas that are quickly developing. The hypothesis that vehicles were the source of pollutants was confirmed when roadway runoff was collected from this stretch of State Route 520 in Seattle. And this runoff was found to be lethal to both coho juveniles and adults. We recently learned through our collaborators at the University of Washington Tacoma Center for Urban Waters that the toxicant that's responsible for coho uh, urban runoff mortality syndrome is in fact sourced from tires. And this chemical is called 6-PPD quinone. It's a transformation product of a common tire additive called 6-PPD, and it protects against the weathering and cracking of a tire. So it's commonly used in car and truck tires and even in the rubber soles of your shoes. Now, currently no toxicology data exists on 6-PPD quinone, uh, to explain why coho are dying so suddenly when they're exposed to low concentrations of this chemical. However, my research over the last couple of years explores the toxic mode of action, and I was able to demonstrate that blood-brain barrier breakdown in coho occurs when they're exposed to roadway runoff. So the blood-brain barrier is formed by cells that line the inner walls of blood vessels in the brain, and these are called endothelial cells. Now the spaces between the endothelial cells are sealed and gated by what are known as tight junctions. So when toxicants like 6-PPD quinone disrupt these endothelial cells, it leads to the opening of those tight junctions or an opening of those gates. And it allows toxicants and other blood plasma constituents to enter the central nervous system and disrupt neuronal function. And this leads to death in severe cases such as what we see in coho. Now, understanding the toxic mode of action is important to look for sublethal effects in other species, such as Chinook salmon that are threatened in the Puget Sound. And although Chinook are not as sensitive to runoff exposure as coho, meaning they don't, they don't die as quickly, uh, exposure to 6-PPD quinone may still induce toxic effects that reduce their survival. Now, the good news is, is that we know that stormwater can be treated with bioretention to remove that toxicity. And so Chelsea is now going to talk more about stormwater remediation through low impact development. We'll turn it over to Chelsea. Thank you, Steph. Let me just pull up my slides now. Okay, so to talk about the solution to toxic stormwater, we need to circle back to the cause, which Steph was talking about at the beginning. Um, so natural landscapes like the forest you can see on the left are pervious. So that means they allow rainfall to infiltrate into the ground through their soils and plants. Developed landscapes, which might look a little more familiar to everyone these days, um, such as this roadway, which is it's the Aurora Bridge in Seattle on the right, um, they're impervious. So th this means that when rain falls on these surfaces, it can't infiltrate into the ground and instead it runs off, picking up contaminants that have been deposited, such as tire wear particles, also metals, oils, other wear from vehicles and exhaust. The way we develop the physical infrastructure in our neighborhoods and cities has a direct impact on the quality and security of our water resources. When rainfall uh, occurs on natural landscapes, it infiltrates soil where it's filtered, stored, and recharges our groundwater supply. But when rain falls on developed landscapes, much less water infiltrates the ground. And this reduced infiltration causes rainfall to run off into local waterways, flushing the contaminants along with it. These disturbances in the water cycle also cause increased flooding and drought and decreased groundwater recharge, all of which can be exacerbated by climate change. And since impervious surfaces are the primary cause of these stormwater impacts, 
A sustainable solution is to increase the amount of pervious surfaces that we have on our landscape. And this can be done by installing what we call green stormwater infrastructure. So this is a picture of, of a swale on a curb of a road where water is uh, diverted to and is able to infiltrate the ground. So um, green stormwater infrastructure in general is a type of decentralized stormwater treatment that's aimed at restoring the natural hydrology to a developed landscape. So to go more from our concrete jungle type landscapes to uh, in the direction of that beautiful forested landscape we were looking at earlier. Um, these systems are installed strategically to treat runoff before it can enter receiving waters. And there's many types of green stormwater infrastructure, um, but I heard from Bianca that there's a rain garden being installed soon in downtown Vashon. So I'm going to focus on bioretention um, and how that works to clean stormwater. So bioretention systems, this is just a little diagram of one. Um, they're small built ecosystems made up of engineered soils that are designed to rapidly infiltrate stormwater um, as it runs off of roads and sidewalks. Um, Bioreten, or sorry, <laughs> here's an example uh, from a neighborhood I used to live in in Seattle. Um, there's a series of bioretention swales underneath the Aurora Bridge that were installed sometime in the last five years or so. And they capture runoff from this, uh, from the Aurora Bridge and treat about 2 million gallons of this highly toxic runoff generated by the bridge each year. Um, they are also really beautiful to look at. And, and I think, uh, you know, I'd rather see that in my neighborhood than, than just a sidewalk by itself. But so how does bioretention work? How does soils and plants together um, help us clean our water? Well, stormwater is directed into bioretention systems, um, you know, stormwater filled with pollutants, and it's captured in a ponding layer. Um, and then as the water, as the captured water infiltrates these engineered soils, um, which in Washington is made up mostly of sand and compost, it's treated. Um, and to understand how, what kind of treatment occurs, let's zoom in to a little bit of soil in a bioretention system and see what's happening. So one really uh, prominent way for pollutants to be removed by bioretention systems is that they can adsorb or stick to little particles inside the media. Also, these systems are living, and so there's microbes and fungi or, or bacteria and fungi living in there, and they can actually consume um, these various contaminants, especially organic contaminants, and they can also take up nutrients and metals that, that we view as contaminants as well. Um, pollutants that are that tend to be attached to other particles in stormwater um, can be filtered by the soil media directly. Um, and then also plants can take up uh, pollutants and use them for food. And so um, our lab group has conducted several experiments over the years where we've collected highway runoff shown in this this gross carboy here, um, and, and we've run them through bioretention mesocosms. Um, mesocosms are basically like a small slice of one of these bioretention systems that we use to make experimenting with them a lot easier. Um, and so before the stormwaters pass through one of these mesocosms, uh, stormwater is acutely toxic to both adult and juvenile coho and, and kills 100% of the fish that are exposed to it. But then after waters pass through bioretention mesocosms, it's visually much cleaner. You can see in the picture here, a lot of the contaminants that we measure in the water are reduced, um, but also it does not kill coho. So whatever mechanism is trapping, um, if, you, if you recall the, the 6-PPD quinone tire chemical in here, um, it's, it's preventing that chemical from getting to the salmon after it passes through this system. So that's all wonderful. Green stormwater infrastructure sounds great, um, but for it to really protect our watersheds, we need to install it widely and strategically across the landscape. Um, bio, bioretention systems require land to be built, but other types of uh, green and stormwater infrastructure can be used in places where it's not uh, possible to change our current land use. For example, permeable pavements can re replace traditional paved parking lots and sidewalks and allow water uh, to infiltrate beneath them. Uh, green roofs can capture and treat roof runoff. And even rain barrels, which you might see in some people's yards, um, can divert and store rainfall that would otherwise become part of this, the stormwater problem. 
And at WSU in Puyallup, we're researching many of the practical issues related to implementing green stormwater technologies. So we're studying ways to reinforce permeable pavements with stronger materials so that they can be used more widely. We're studying how long bioretention soils last and how deep they need to be to, make, to ensure adequate water treatment. We're adding new materials and new organisms such as biochar and fungi to bioretention systems to try to optimize contaminant removal. We're studying the role of mulch in bioretention systems for reducing maintenance costs. And we're even studying the water budget of large native trees to see how trees can inter intercept and store water that would otherwise become runoff. And so Stephanie and I just want to leave you with this thought that, that the things that we do in our neighborhoods on, on the landscape um, are directly tied to the health of our salmon and the health of our waters. So please ask us questions later if you have any. Wonderful. Thank you, Stephanie and Chelsea. That was great. I learned a lot. I didn't know there was that huge bioretention thing down underneath the Aurora Bridge. Makes me happy. <laughs> that was really a great talk. And I'm sure that it brought up a lot of questions for everybody. So hold on to them for the end. Um, so now let's let's pretend we're a little salmon that was raised in a creek or that was born in a creek that Chelsea and Stephanie have been working on. So it's super clean and we're super healthy and we're ready to go out and get into the, the salt water because we're getting big enough. So we swim down the stream and we go out into the Puget Sound. And that's where we encounter our next speaker, Jason Toft, doing his research on the shoreline. So Jason is a principal research scientist at the University of Washington School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences. And he focuses on nearshore restoration and specifically the effects of shoreline armoring or bulkheading in Puget Sound. And so he's gonna be talking a little bit about what he's found so far. And he's collaborated on some studies with us here with the Nature Center on Vashon. So um, we've learned a lot from him and I'm excited to see this talk tonight. Okay, go ahead, Jason. Great. Thank you. I've learned a lot from you all as well. So this is all a two way street, right? Or a roundabout or something. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks for the invitation and good to virtually see folks here. And right, here's some juvenile salmon. Uh, this is what they look like when we do our snorkel surveys. We try to take, you know, photos and videos on the good days where visibility is really good. So here's a shot from a good day where we can actually see really well what we're doing. So this is, um, I bet this photo was taken by the Olympic Sculpture Park in downtown Seattle. So even in our watersheds where the water is not so clean, we still have salmon. Um, so a lot of our research of course is built to, to measure how these fish are reacting to their environment in general and oftentimes to near shore restoration. So I'll talk to you about that today, representing our lab group. We call ourselves the Wetland Ecosystem Team and a host of students and techs and folks through the years. Okay, so let's move to people now. Fish are important for many different reasons and people are important. And what's drawn me to work on these shoreline sites is that interaction of humans and their environment. I've always been attracted to that and um, you know, for recreation as well as for my science life. And so, Here's a photo up at Bowman Bay, up on Deception Pass, and it's at low tide. So of course you get this amazing intertidal area exposed. And shown here is a group of people, some from UW, some from Northwest Straits Foundation, some from WVFW. And so this was in 2019. Um, we still all work together, but of course, uh, a little trickier now. Anyway, uh, it's, it's been great to like meet a bunch of groups of people over the years at these sites and the input of community scientists is really important in broadening what we can learn from these sites. Okay, so I'll talk to you about mostly about sites such as this. And uh, Juhi here in the foreground, she has a quadrat and is looking at beach rack settled out on the upper beach. And we do a number of surveys down into the lower inner tidal. And so I'm not gonna talk to you purely about salmon today. What I like to talk a lot about as well is the habitat that these uh, small fish rely on when they're first out migrating. 
Um, Chinook salmon, chum salmon, a lot of these juvenile salmon, when they first out migrate and hit Puget Sound shorelines, they really hug the shoreline and they're looking for this type of beach where it's a shallow water gradient. There's lots of food produced. They feed on small invertebrates. Um, some of those are insects that are living along shoreline vegetation. So again, that interaction of the terrestrial and the marine environment is really important. Um, okay, and I'll and I'll talk more about this a little bit, but armoring, right? And so when I say armor, that's a seawall, a bulkhead, riprap, any kind of thing that we as humans put along the shoreline uh, to buttress it from the waters. And so uh, sites like this, such as Bowen Bay, where armor has been removed, we go out and see how effective that is. Um, and at a site like this, when the armor is removed, we refer to placement loss. And so, again, that's why we often focus on these, uh, the, these, the intertidal zone really high up, because that's where we find the most direct impacts of armor placement a lot of times. Okay, I like this slide, so I, li I like just talking at this slide because it makes me happy uh, looking out there at Bowman Bay. Um, we'll see more of that. Okay. Let's move around to some different beaches. Uh, this one is at Seahurst Park. It's in the city of Burien, south of Seattle. And so um, it's kind of near the airport, really. If you ever go to SeaTac, uh, check out Seahurst Park if you have an hour or so to kill. So it's a really pretty park along the water. And I'm showing you this time series of armor removal. So in the upper photograph here, this is kind of a jumble of stuff, right? These, these big rocks, just we refer to as riprap a lot, these big rocks, and then going up in kind of this mishmash of a seawall. Um, so this was removed, this, this stretch here was removed in 2005. Afterwards, uh, the middle photo is what it looked like. So uh, some sediment was brought in to build up the beach surface. Some logs were placed, some vegetation planted. Um, so it's not just yanking out armoring a lot of the time. There's this combination of bringing in sediments and vegetation. And it looks pretty fresh, right? It looks like the way a rain garden might look uh, when it's first put in. And given time, this lower picture is what it looks like nowadays. So if you go there, um, check it out because, you know, you probably wouldn't ever think there was armoring there in the first place. And that's the goal. We love this overhanging vegetation. We love this driftwood coming in and the beach rack settling out. Um, it really brings up that dynamic, that dynamic realm again of where we get that interaction of the terrestrial and marine environment. Okay, so Sears Park is a site that we've studied a lot. And again, you know, when you just look at this middle photo, it looks great. Like, yeah, oh, yeah, they got rid of that armor. They put in this beach. I bet it works great. Um, so we uh, we always pay attention to construction because. Uh, who knows if it's going to be great or not? This is another site down in Eld Inlet in South Sound. And, you know, when armoring comes out, well, when armoring is placed and when it comes out, it's a construction site. Um, there is heavy equipment on the beach and it's very disruptive. Uh, it just really is. And so it takes time to have things grow again. And and a lot of the work our lab has done over the years is testing exactly for that. So we, we phrase that as restoration effectiveness that we're measuring. Um, we're not trying to prove it works per se. We are nerdy scientists. So we want to collect data and have the data tell us if it's working or not. So we're, we're measuring for effectiveness. And this is a huge reason why, because um, there's this really, you're starting from time zero again, and we try to measure through time. OK. Um, so let's look at what the goal is and so and refer to salmon again. So this is a cross section of a nice natural beach. Um, these middle blue green colors here, this is the intertidal zone. You can see some juvenile salmon here. They feed along the bottom substrate in the water column and also picking off stuff from the surface. And so again, you could have insects falling uh, from the sky under the water surface that they could eat. They could be feeding in any kind of shoreline vegetation or in uh, invertebrates produced in the benthosphere. Um, and you know, salmon are amazing for many reasons. And when when they first hit the salt water, they need abundant prey. They have to grow so they can survive and get to the next stage. They don't want to be eaten by bigger things, right? So you don't want a lot of predators around. Um, they have to acclimate to salinity, and so. 
I work a lot. Um, I work at UW in Seattle, so I do work a lot in the Duwamish, Elliott Bay, and um, you know, there's salmon coming through there, and it is very industrial. And so sometimes people say like, "Oh, just get them through that, get them out of the ocean," and it's just not that simple. You really have to provide beneficial habitat for them along the whole way because they need time to acclimate to salt water. Uh, so really, we're just going through this healthy out migration corridor so that we can get them to the next stage and get them out so they can return as adults. Okay, so as mentioned previously, I'm a nerdy scientist, so I do have to show you results of one study. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to show you a ton of graphs and tables or anything. I'm going to show you this one snapshot of a project that was funded by Washington Sea Grant. I call this my Tetra slide, and so what is going on here? I, we did a whole lot of measurements on these things that have small photographs on the side. So beach rack, that is the algae, eelgrass, leaf litter that settles on the upper beach on an ebbing tide. Beach rack, logs and riparian vegetation. Um, these rack invertebrates, these, uh, well, I love these, so I'll, I'll tell you about them. Uh, these live underneath the algae and eelgrass that settles on the upper beach. And um, these amphipods, they're fascinating to me at least. Uh, they don't live in pure salt water. They can't live in pure water or on the land. They need this moist environment um, that's salty underneath that beach rack. And so again, when you have placement loss of armoring, um, that doesn't settle out. Okay, I'll tell you more about that in a bit. But, um, and also insects. And so you can see here that I don't have salmon on the slide. Again, we're looking at the habitat features of beaches and the invertebrate production, production there. Okay, so what do all these different colors mean? We went out and sampled at 10 armored beaches where there's some kind of seawall or riprap, 10 beaches that were restored with armor removed, and then 10 reference beaches, the best natural state. And lighter blue means less of whatever, and darker blue means more. And so you can see all these armored beaches have less of the stuff. The restored beaches were kind of in between. Beach rack comes in quickly. Um, you know, driftwood and riparian vegetation just takes more time. It makes sense. A lot of that driftwood moves around in our winter storms. Um, and a lot of these inver invertebrates were in between. And so uh, still not totally at the reference conditions. And that's kind of my intermission slide here. My key message is that we're finding these shoreline restoration projects are effective initially on improving upon armored shorelines. Um, and with time may reach natural conditions. Uh, we're still measuring that. A lot of these sites are really fresh. So the average age of restoration of the study I just talked about was four years. And so um, we're getting more sites out there and we keep measuring and we'll learn more. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit here about what we are doing with this data. And uh, Bianca and Maria and the Bashan Nature Center has been great on working on this project. And you know, I'm pretty sure this photo was taken at Dockton Park, come to think of it, um, when we all met out there a few years back. And so this database came out of, of all these different groups working on this together and what to do with data. Um, to, for data to be useful, you have to combine it with others and make sense of it. And so uh, I encourage you to go there to this website, check it out. Even if you're not interested in the data, there's a map there of all the different sites where people have been collecting data. Um, there's some example visualizations of the data if you do want to see some graphs. And we're building on this. And if, and if nothing I just said appeals to you, you can at least see some pretty watercolors of our postdoc, Simone DeRoche. Uh, she's super smart and a great scientist. And it turns out she's really good at watercolors. So she has made the website more beautiful, really. And, uh, and these are the protocols that we have in the database right now. So I talked a bit about these top four. Um, some other ones here on uh, sediments and other invertebrates, and, and we're still building this out. We're, we're hoping to add fish soon and some, um, and some other things that people are collecting this data on so that we can all share the data. Okay, so I'm in the home stretch here, and uh, the title of this uh, series we're talking tonight is Living Waters, and so I wanted to mention living shorelines. I think it's a good uh, piece of terminology to be aware of when we talk about our shorelines nowadays. You know, when I started out at UW, we always talk about restoration, and I still talk about restoration a lot, but oftentimes it's really hard to do pure restoration where, when you're technically restoring to, you know, natural conditions. And so this phrase, living shorelines, came about just recognizing that sometimes you have 
some artificial components still involved. You might need a bit of armor to buttress the side of the beach. Um, and certainly when you're bringing in sediment and anchoring logs per se, these are aspects that aren't um, pure restoration, but they're more living shorelines. And so keep an eye out for this term. Um, and you see engineering up here on the side too. So it's kind of a progression from pure restoration to living shorelines to engineering. We often call this eco-engineering, and I'll just show you one picture here of some of our other work where we do snorkel surveys. And gosh, it's like snorkeling in a movie set. I've never been on a movie set, but when we first went out here, this is along downtown Seattle. And if you take the ferry over and walk along the sidewalk there, you are walking right above us. Uh, and not just us, but you're watching, walking above fish. And so these glass panels on the sidewalk are meant to get more light to the water because juvenile salmon, they're visual feeders. Um, this climbing wall situation is meant just to put more diversity, make it a more complex seawall than just straight concrete. And there's some other ledges and benches down here as well to try to mimic shallow water habitat when you cannot you're not going to restore this area but you can add a few beneficial components we think and we're out there measuring that all right with that thanks a lot for listening and uh, i love questions too so save your questions ask us and or ask me them later thanks a lot great thank you jason that was great i liked hearing about the the seawall and didn't you just have a didn't you just have a big newspaper article that came out? Oh, we had something. We well, we, we had this podcast, which was funny. Like, you know, you'd be open to whatever. And this podcast, these podcast people got a hold of us and wanted to meet us downtown Seattle. And it happened to be our first field day this year. And we didn't do anything in 2020. So it'd been like almost two years since we snorkeled. And I was like, yeah, meet us downtown. And it was super fun. They did a great job. <laughs> great. Yeah, so um, maybe we'll put the, the podcast in the link I or in the chat so people can learn more about the Seattle Seawall project that you have there. Great, so so thanks. And um, over, over the years, re research in the, the marine um, environment here at the Puget Sound has really focused on that shallow water that Jason has been talking about. Um, but nobody has really looked at if there are any impacts due to what we do on our shorelines deeper out. How far do they go? Um, and so Tessa, who is uh, an islander, is here tonight um, to, to talk to us about the pioneering research she's doing on, on how far do the effects of shoreline restoration go, how deep. Um, and so Tessa is the lead ecologist at Puget Sound Institute of, of University of Washington, Tacoma. And she's the managing director of the Ocean Modeling Forum. And her work focuses on linking science to decision-making. And she's uh, also got a lot of decision-making at home, it sounds like, because she's got two humans, two goats, two bunnies, eight chickens, a Labrador retriever, a Russian tortoise, and a cat to take care of. <laughs> so <laughs> that's pretty impressive that you do that and all this research. All right. Tessa, why don't you go ahead and um, give it a whirl with your talk. Thanks. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here tonight. Thanks you all for coming. Um, I want to thank my collaborators on this work and in particular, um, my team member, Genoa Sillaway, who made some of these slides that I'm stealing. Um, also, I want to give a big thanks to Jason Toft for really setting the stage um, for my talk, because really this is just sort of a part two or a continuation um, of the themes that Jason was just talking about. I'm really going to just extend the conversation, as Bianca said, into deeper waters, um, not metaphorically, just literally deeper waters <laughs> um, for a while. Jason and his many collaborators have done an excellent job of really identifying um, the impacts of armor on our beaches and our intertidal areas and are really making headway in terms of understanding the effectiveness of that armor removal for returning the benefits that beaches and intertidal habitats can provide for fishes. This project, as Bianca said, really focuses on understanding how armor affects fish use of subtidal habitats. So subtidal habitats are the 
habitats that are just adjacent to the beaches and the intertidal zones. The light still penetrates to the bottom. It's where we find much of the eelgrass growing. It's where fish spend much of their time hanging out. We know that sub shallow subtidal zones are really important nursery habitats for many juvenile fishes. And I get to skip through some introductory slides um, because Jason did it um, and just get to my question, which is really, you know, does shoreline structure, either the presence of armor or the subsequent removal of armor and the restoration of the shoreline really affect fish use of these important habitats? What are the benefits of restoration for subtitle habitats? And does shoreline structure affect fish use of these habitats. And so we, and, and so you can think about the subtitle zone as being on kind of the far right hand side of this figure um, in the deeper waters where we see lots of fish, we see eelgrass and we know these are really important for supporting juvenile fish in their journey to becoming adults. And so um, we pursued these questions um, focusing, I know that this is a salmon night and you're all here to hear about salmon and we will be focusing on two salmon species, Chinook salmon and chum salmon. But our work is also, um, we're also interested in understanding how shoreline restoration affects a couple other species of forage fish, namely herring and smelt. So why do we care to take our conversation away from salmon into herring and smelt? So the, that's because um, if you care about salmon, you should care about herring and smelt. You should care about forage fish because forage fish in Puget Sound and in every marine system where they exist uh, feed the larger fish like salmon. They feed the birds, they feed the marine mammals. Um, so they're really important in the food webs. If you've ever heard me talk about forage fish, um, you've also heard me talk about their importance economically. They support commercial and recreational fisheries. As you can see in the middle here, this is an image of uh, the Bonanza herring fishery um, in Sitka, Alaska. And, and forage fish in particular herring are also really important socially and culturally. For example, the harvesting of herring eggs in the spring is a really important um, practice um, and uh, ritual for many of our Pacific coastal tribes. So we care about forage fish not only because they support salmon, but because they provide all these other benefits as well to our social ecological system. So our work is going to be looking at Chinook and Chum salmon and herring and smelt. And we are doing our research um, at six different sites around Puget Sound, ranging from the San Juan Islands up in the north all the way down to Olympia, including our beloved Docton, which I can look out my window and see from right here in my house. Um, we also are surveying at Seahurst, um, where Jason just showed us some pictures, and Cornet Bay, which is just adjacent to uh, Bowman Bay that he was showing us. We have balanced design of three sites where we have eelgrass and three sites where we do not have eelgrass. Uh, that's because we suspect that eelgrass plays an important role. Um, and within each of these sites, we also have three different segments of shoreline. We have an armored shoreline segment, we have a natural or reference shoreline segment, and then we have a chunk of the shoreline where the armor has been removed and the beach has been restored. And what we're asking is across all these six sites, if we look within a single site and we survey fish in front of these three different shoreline types, do we see that the fish are using the subtitle habitats in front of these areas differently? Do we see that fish, that herring and smelt and juvenile salmon prefer to hang out in front of these natural sites or, um, or do they not, can they not tell the difference between a natural site and an armored site? Do the fish care is what our question really is. And so the way we're observing fish is we're, um, we're conducting surveys using a Lampara net, which is just a modified purse seine. We throw it off the front of our boat, we purse it up, we bring it on board, we count and measure and identify and measure the fish that we catch. 
We do that at each of the three shoreline segments per site, and we do it at three different distances offshore, starting very shallow in the very shallow subtitle, and then increasing distance offshore. So we do these surveys. Uh, I'm going to show you results from two years in 2018 and 2019. The work is continuing now. We're even getting Jason out on the boat with us to help us throw this net, get out of his wetsuit, help us work on the boat. Um, and six months a year between April and September. So for the math fans in the audience, I'll just I'll tell you how we're analyzing our data. Uh, we're using Bayesian generalized linear models to estimate abundance of each species separately um, as a function of three major factors. So we think that there, we hypothesize that there are three major factors that are influencing abundance of these species um, at these sites. Survey site, so where we are in Puget Sound, shoreline structure, armored, natural, or restored, and the presence or absence of eelgrass. We run a bunch of different models using these different factors in combination, and we rank the models based on which model fits the data best. And I'm going to be showing you results from those best models today. So I, unlike Jason, I am going to throw a bunch of graphs at you, but I will take my time and explain them, hopefully, uh, so that we can all be on the same page. So there's going to be two main messages that I want you to take away from each graph that I share with you. Each one is going to be for a, a single species. So this graph is going to be just for Chinook salmon. And the, there's going to be two main messages. What's the best model? So what is the best predictor of Chinook abundance? Uh, in our observations, number one. And then number two, what is the pattern that we observed? And so here for Chinook salmon, the best predictor of Chinook salmon abundance was just survey site, just geographic location. Where in Puget Sound are we? And so here you, along the bottom are our six sites ranging from north to south. FAM is, one of, is our family tied site up on Orcas Island. And then here's Docton in the dashed line, and then down to Edgewater on the far right. That's our site down in Olympia. So there's our six different sites. And then on the vertical axis is fish abundance per individual net haul. And so you can, so message number one is that Chinook don't, our data do not show that Chinook are really responding to the presence or absence of armor on the shoreline or the influence of restoration. What they're responding to more is just where in the Puget Sound are they? That's number one. And then number two, what we can see is that we found most, the most abundance of Chinook at this site up on um, Deception Pass at Cornet Bay. And here's Docton down here, unfortunately showing us the lowest, the lowest abundance among the group, except for this one site, Family Tides with the asterisk where we didn't observe any Chinook at all. As you just explain these little gray hills, you can think of these gray hills as sort of hills of probability. So this is the output from our model, which tells you that if you just look at the Coronet Bay data, it tells you that we are, there's a 90% probability that the real abundance, which we are observing imperfectly because we're people on a boat with a net just doing it, you know, a few times, but the real abundance of Chinook, we have a 90% probability that the real abundance of Chinook is somewhere within that range. And then the peak of that hill is where the bulk of the evidence lies, that we are, the, we are most confident that the real value is that number. So we're most confident that there's about four Chinook per net haul um, up at Cornet Bay which if you think about it is like, it's a little bit sad. You're out there for hours and hours and hours and you pull it out and you get four Chinook, but that's all right, that's, that's the way it goes. So, so for the Chinook salmon, they don't seem to really be responding to the structure of the shoreline, whether there's armor there or whether the armor has been removed or whether it's a, it's a reference, a natural site. Oops, I keep doing that. So the story is a little bit different for chum salmon. For chum salmon, what we found is that the best predictor, the factor that predicts abundance of chum salmon most is the presence or absence of eelgrass. In fact, we found 12 times the abundance of chum salmon at sites with eelgrass versus sites without eelgrass. So that includes Seahurst Park, where Jason was showing us the construction site, catch a lot of chum there. Um, that's one of our sites that has eelgrass. So, and this is, this confirms results that 
other people have shown in other systems that um, chum really depend on these eelgrass beds um, in their juvenile stages. So, but again, no, no association in our, our data between chum, salmon, and uh, shoreline armor or, or shoreline restoration. The story is different for the forage fish species though. So here I'm showing you results for herring and, uh, and it gets a little bit more complicated. So I'll walk you through this figure now. So now I have fish abundance on the horizontal axis and the sites are lined up on the vertical axis. And, and for herring, the best model, in, the best predictors of herring abundance were survey sites. So where in Puget Sound are they? But also what was the shoreline structure? Was it armored, was it restored and, or was it a natural site? But what we found was that herring, the highest herring abundance was found at the natural sites. And so I've tried to make this graph really clear for you by clustering. So here I'm showing you three different probability hills for each site. There's a probability hill for the armored uh, segment of shoreline, for the natural shoreline, and for the restored shoreline. Um, and each site has a cluster of three except uh, we have two sites where we did not ever observe herring, Seahurst and uh, Edgewater down in Olympia. But the sites where we did find herring, we consistently found the highest abundance of herring at the natural sites. So they do seem to care what the shoreline looks like, but in this case, the restoration, as Jason was hinting at, maybe the restoration hasn't had time to really have an effect out there in deeper waters. Um, these sites are similar to what Jason was talking about. These restoration sites are between three and seven years old, because we do see some small, small differences between um, the armored sites for the armored shorelines, for example, and the natural and restored, like the armored, the abundance at the armored shorelines for herring were always the lowest. So herring do seem to care a little bit about the shoreline structure and they seem to prefer natural sites the most. The smelt story is the most complicated of all of them <laughs> and the results are sort of the most subtle. I should point out that almost every picture I'm showing you guys was uh, taken at Docton just to make just to make all of, all of you feel happy. <laughs> you can recognize your island. Um, so, so the story for smelt's a little bit more complicated. Like with herring, the best predictors of smelt were survey sites. So where in Puget Sound are you? Are they? And then also they did seem to care about shoreline structure, but the way they felt about shoreline structure varied from site to site. So up here in family tides on the very top, um, we found the highest abundance of smelt at the restored site. So that's super good news. Um, this happens to be like a really beautiful home in this really nice bay. And it's like, it's a really welcoming place to be. <laughs> so I think I, I, that's how I feel. So I think the smelt feels the same way. But down here in Cornette Bay, um, we found the highest abundance of smelt in the natural sites. So, and then the other, other sites, um, were kind of trickier because we we didn't find smelt at all three shoreline types like in Docton we only ever observed smelt at the restored sites so we couldn't really compare it very well to the other to the other uh, shoreline types so so the message with smelt is a little bit um I have to wave my hands a little bit more about the message except to say that it appears that shoreline structure matters more for smelt uh, matters for the forage fish more than than for the salmon Okay, so just quick summary. Uh, we have not yet found in our observations a clear effect of this local scale restoration on the abundance of fish in subtitle habitats. Uh, geographic location and eelgrass are the best predictors of salmon abundance. And for herring, natural shorelines seem to support the greatest abundance. For smelt, like I've said repeatedly now, shorelines matter, but the effect really varies by site and it's sort of a weak effect. Um, and the thing that I like to end with here is just to remind us that, you know, there's a lot of effort that's being put into restoring these small local, these small sections of the shoreline around Puget Sound. And we're looking at the local effects and that that's right. Like that's, a, that's important. We should be looking at that, but we should also be remembering that these juvenile salmon and these juvenile forage fish are operating in a broader, much broader landscape than just an individual uh, shoreline section. They're hanging out on a piece of shoreline for a little while and then they're moving on. 
And what we're looking forward to next with funding from Washington Sea Grant is to take a broader landscape look, uh, looking at shoreline restoration all around Puget Sound and asking, you know, what are the landscape drivers of, um, of the use of nearshore habitat by juvenile fish? And what does a healthy Puget Sound shoreline really look like when we take a broader perspective? Um, so that's where, where we're going next. I look forward to uh, I look forward to coming back and sharing findings with you guys about that. And I should just thank our funders um, and the many, 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 many people who came out and dragged a net with us. Um, and thank y'all for being here tonight. Appreciate it. Great, thank you, Tessa. That's really a, a good lesson in how, um, and a good segue to our next speaker in how there are so many factors that uh, affect salmon at all different places in their life cycle and how it can be affecting different species of salmon different ways and um, that we need to look at the food chain. So it's, it's, that was great. Lots of good information and so fun to see docked in there and think of you talking about it right out your window <laughs> it's sitting there. Yeah. So, um, so thank you. And our next speaker is going to take that big landscape regional view that uh, Tessa was talking about and um, talk to us a little bit more about salmon conservation and restoration of salmon populations at a larger scale. Uh, Joseph Bogard is with us. He's also from Vashon Island. He's the executive director of Save Our Wild Salmon. And he's gonna be talking to us about restoring the Lower Snake River. And that is, um, so, so we can, we can um, picture ourselves going way up into the air, way above Puget Sound and looking at the entire um, Pacific coast and, and, um, and beyond. And that's kind of where these salmon operate on these large scales. So um, take it away, Joseph. Thanks, Bianca. Um, uh, and uh, someone will let me know if my if I'm not figuring the technology out here. Uh, you'd think I'd be an expert at it by now, uh, given the last year. But uh, one never knows. Uh, I want to thank VCA and 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 VNC for hosting this program, and for uh, the other speakers as well for sharing your work with us tonight. Uh, I've been learning a lot. Uh, and I look forward to the, the Q&A uh, afterwards. And I think I want to thank everyone else for being here this evening on this nice uh, night uh, and for being curious uh, and for caring. Uh, as, as Bianca said, my name's Joseph Bogart. I live here on Vashon. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Sarah Wild Salmon. And we're a coalition organization uh, with conservation organizations, uh, fishing associations, uh, orca and clean energy advocates, and we're all working together to protect and restore salmon to Northwest rivers and marine waters for the benefit of people and ecosystems. Uh oh. My, uh, my screen's not advancing. If oh, you go, go down to the very corner and click on There the we go. Yeah, there you go. Um, to start, we, we've said, talked about it a little bit, but um, I, I wanna just take a brief moment to underscore sort of how essential, how fundamental these, these fish, salmon and steelhead are to everything and everyone in our region. Uh, I don't think one can really understand or appreciate the Northwest and its ecology, economy, culture, food, history, tribes without understanding and appreciating salmon. Uh, many Native Americans that I work with on salmon restoration uh, cannot, uh, you know, think of themselves or their communities without salmon. For them, salmon recovery and 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 uh, is an existential issue. Um, you know, who would they be without salmon? And I think this is a question as Northwesterners we all ought to be asking ourselves these days. Uh, I'm going to focus, as, as uh, uh, Bianca indicated, sort of at a, another scale, and I'm going to focus a bit more on sort of policy uh, and, and a bit less on science. Um, uh, my comments will, will focus up on the regional scale. Uh, it, it, this is a map of the uh, Colombian Snake River Basin. Uh, it's an area about the size of France. 
uh, uh, the basin not long ago was the most productive salmon landscape on the planet. Uh, think of uh, you know the Serengeti uh, in Africa or the bison in the Great Plains of the Midwest uh, a couple of centuries ago, overwhelming abundance. Uh, and in addition, of course, to their historical abundance, salmon are these amazing connectors. They connect ocean and river, forest and desert, urban and rural, tribes and non-tribes. Um, and as Bianca said, I think in the beginning statement, uh, in early statements, you know, 130 or more other fish and wildlife species depend upon or benefit from salmon. Um, returning adult salmon deliver huge amounts of nutrients from the ocean to the lands and having done so over uncountable centuries, they have literally built our forests and, 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 and our regions incredibly rich biodiversity. Uh, and then this map also reflects some of those orange uh, zones reflect the, the more than 15 tribes who call the Columbia Basin home, traditional homelands since time immemorial. And I'll just sort of chime in here. If, if you haven't visited and explored the Columbia Basin, uh, it's, a, it's a big, amazing, diverse place. And, and I encourage you to do so, to get to know its the lands and waters and, and, and people and history. Um, salmon in, in the Columbia Basin look very different today than they used to not so long ago. Uh, the abundance of salmon is largely gone. Uh, many runs have disappeared. Many of those that remain are just holding on. Uh, we've built more than 400 dams in the Columbia Basin in the last 100 or so years. And those dams have severed this sort of diverse, sprawling, interconnected river system into a series of walls and lakes. Uh, dams are the single largest source of human caused mortality for salmon and steelhead in the Columbia Basin. And I think these next few uh, images and graphs speak for themselves. They just, they, they reflect how we have moved over time uh, from salmon abundance to salmon scarcity. Uh, this, this, this particular graph reflects the uh, decline over time of Snake River adult spring summer Chinook, uh, which once returned to the Snake River Basin by the millions, this year, the predictions are 11,000 fish will return. Most of those are hatchery fish. Uh, some of them are wild. Um, this second graph, uh, more extreme. This is uh, Snake River sockeye. This is the, the first salmon listed under the Endangered Species Act anywhere uh, in the United States was Snake River sockeye uh, back in 1991. And we almost lost them as you can see, uh, but the, the, these fish are amazingly persistent and, and there's been a lot of hard work to um, uh, keep them from going extinct, but they're, they're still uh, struggling. This next graph, Snake River steelhead, once again, used to return by the millions, now they return by the thousands. Uh, and, and this sort of compilation of graphs comes from a recent uh, Nez Perce tribal study, an extinction assessment, and their study predicts that dozens of salmon runs that use tributaries in the Snake River Basin today uh, will, will go extinct in the next several years uh, unless immediate action is taken, including uh, but not limited to uh, restoring the Lower Snake River by removing its dams. So all of remaining populations of salmon and steelhead in the Snake River Basin face extinction today. How do we get here? Um, you know, four federal dams and their reservoirs in Southeast Washington have been at the center of this debate for more than three decades. Uh, these are for salmon, four dams too many. The dams and their reservoirs slow in warm waters. They kill fish and turbines. They, they cause exhaustion and injury. They increase predation by other fish that prefer stagnant waters. And the cumulative effects have just been too much. For the, the main source of mortality for Snake River fish uh, are for the juveniles heading out to the ocean. Um, and 70% you know, of these young fish migrating through uh, eight reservoirs and, and eight dams 
to get to the ocean and die before they, they, ever, they ever arrive. Scientists have told us for a very long time and very clearly that in order to avoid extinction, we're, we're gonna need to re remove these dams and restore this river. Um, our, our region uh, and our, our, our leaders have spent decades running from this issue, uh, producing inadequate plans, losing lawsuits in court, spending billions of dollars on programs that haven't restored the fish, and, and they've continued their decline towards extinction. Uh, and of course, this is associated with pain and loss by many communities, tribal communities, non-tribal fishing communities, uh, for Southern resident orcas who rely on Chinook salmon for their survival and so much more. And the situation has been crying out for political leadership for, for decades. So here's another map of the Columbia Basin uh, and the Snake River. Uh, you can see there uh, is, is the Columbia's largest tributary. Uh, the four lower Snake River dams are highlighted in the circle there in Southeast Washington. Um, one of the reasons that people have been so focused on uh, Snake River and its salmon is because it's, it's really our very best salmon and river restoration opportunity anywhere on the West Coast. In good years, scientists predict that more than a million spring Chinook could return uh, to the mouth of the Columbia, um, uh, you know, spring, spring Chinook that, that would, that would, who, who would be heading up the snake. Um, uh, so incredible restoration opportunity, and that's not even counting the, the restoration potential for fall Chinook, for sockeye, for steelhead, and, and, and other fish. Um, so why is, was this area, why is this, why, why this great restoration potential? Well, there's more than 5,000 miles of high quality protected uh, river and stream miles and salmon habitat upstream from these dams located in southeast Washington. And, and you can see on this map, there's the, the sort of dark green area. That's, that's this mass of protected federal lands and wilderness, high quality habitat. And a lot of it's also high elevation, which means it's cold, which is a really important thing these days as we uh, head deeper into uh, the era of climate change. And scientists call this green area sort of the Noah's Ark for salmon uh, in, a, in a warming climate. So on one hand, we've got crisis, and, and then we've also got this opportunity, if we act, to restore really significant numbers of, of fish. And, and as I said earlier, the situation has been crying out for political leadership for, for years. Neither the federal agencies that have been producing and implementing these plans or the courts can really deliver the, the sort of long-term solution that is gonna work for, for people and for salmon. Um, and it's, it's really incumbent on our elected officials to, to, to step in, bring people together and find a new way forward. Uh, removing these dams, replacing their services, investing in communities. So, um, I'm going to conclude my comments with, uh, you know, with with a call of act, call to action and, and a note of optimism, um, and uh, and and with what salmon and orca and fishing advocates hope is in fact a new beginning, a new opportunity, uh, and and I'll you know I've been working on these issues since the '90s, um, and and you know just in the last few weeks and months have been this sort of real dynamic situation. Um, where the political leadership is finally starting to emerge. And so this talk just coincidentally comes at uh, a, a really interesting and, and hopeful moment. Um, uh, but the public pressure and engagement by lots of people, in, including I know folks on this call or on this uh, uh, Zoom meeting uh, have been critical for, for bringing about that sort of pressure on and support for political leadership. And I'll say, um, you know, now we all have a role to play to support this emerging leadership and to uh, uh, hold our elected officials accountable um, to the promises and, and, and commitments they're making now. And if you have been active, thank you. And if you haven't, I hope that you'll get involved. This is a picture of Mike Simpson. He's a, a, a member of uh, Congress, a conservative Republican from the state of Idaho. 
And in February this year, after more than two years of, of work by he and his staff, he unveiled a transformative proposal to restore the Lower Snake River and its salmon and invest in Northwest communities. Uh, his proposal is this huge opportunity for our region to uh, move past this you know, 30 years or more of conflict and loss He's proposing spending billions of dollars to restore the Lower Snake River and invest in Northwest communities, clean energy, transportation, and other infrastructure. He's, he's you know, for the first time, Northwest leader is giving our region a chance to break away from the failed and, and costly status quo to avoid salmon extinction and begin a real and historic restoration to move from an era of conflict and loss to collaboration uh, and gain and, 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 and to meet our, to, to much better meet our, our nation's uh, responsibilities to tribes. And finally, to make some really big investments in some really critical infrastructure around clean energy and, 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 and help set the Northwest community and economy uh, and environment up for, uh, you know, sort of the challenges we're facing in the 21st century. Um, so, you know, Mr. Simpson unveiled his proposal in February uh, and he invited feedback and partnership. Uh, and then, uh, and, and in doing so, ge has generated a lot of controversy and conversation. Uh, and, and he deserves a tremendous amount of credit for what uh, the conversation that he's, he's kicked off. Um, but, you know, policymakers are talking, advocates, utility sector, farmers, fishers, there's all these different people that rely on the Columbia Basin. Um, in different ways, and, and, and they all have a stake in outcomes and all need to be part of the solution. Uh, well, three weeks ago, uh, U.S. Congressman Earl Blumenauer, a Democrat from Oregon, a progressive Democrat from Oregon, joined forces with Simpson and said he wanted to, he didn't agree with everything Simpson had proposed, but he wanted to work with Simpson to address the issues and problems at the heart of, of, of his proposal. So that was a really amazing step forward, and again, Kind of leadership we've never seen on this issue in in decades then just last week you know maybe some of you saw the headline in in sort of cover article in the seattle times um that the headline was you know more negative i i think than than it it it, it, it could have been but but what effectively happened is the senate one of the most powerful senators in the, in the country and certainly our senior senator in the northwest was patty murray and Governor Inslee also jumped in, in ways that we have never seen before. And they issued a joint statement uh, that that uh, pushed aside the Simpson-led initiative and committed to moving forward with something on their own. Though, to be fair to Mr. Simpson, uh, their rhetoric and language sounded a whole lot like uh, the, the sorts of things he's been talking about. So, you know, at this point in time, things are really dynamic. Um, you know, on, on the one hand, we've got this urgent crisis on the Snake River. Uh, Nez Perce tribe saying we're, we're losing these fish. Um, and I think we're facing what's going to be a really hot, dry summer. Uh, and if folks remember the sort of fish kills that occurred in 2015, when we had these kinds of conditions, uh, it was a huge setback for, you know, for salmon and all the benefits that they bring to our region. Uh, and, and, you know, some folks are predicting we, we could have something that looks like 2015 in 2021. Um, so we've also got this great opportunity uh, if we act and if our leaders who, who have stepped in to engage uh, commit to really moving forward and, and making some difficult choices and, and bringing folks together and bringing them through it together. So, um, you know, all of a sudden uh, things seem to be moving and there's, there's, there's a real opportunity. I, I don't think anything's, uh, uh, you know, is, is guaranteed far from it. And, and um, you know, it's, it's gonna take all of us working uh, with organizations and, and bringing pressure to bear and support on Senator Murray, Governor Inslee uh, and other members, particularly of Congress uh, that really needs to, to deal with this. So exciting time. Um, uh, you know, I would just encourage you to, um, uh, uh, you know, get, learn more. You can visit our website, wildsalmon.org, uh, and you can reach out to me at any time. 
but you know, talk to your friends, uh, talk to your family, uh, contact elected officials. Our, our Congresswoman, of course, is, is Pramila Jayapal, uh, Senator Murray and Cantwell, Jay Inslee. Um, they, um, they need to hear from you and they need to hear that we're relying on them for their leadership. So thanks, uh, thanks a lot for listening and being here and, and I'll look forward to discussions uh, during the question and answer. Great, thank you, Joseph. That was quite the rundown and super interesting to cap off this, um, this speaker's panel, thank you. Um, so, you know, one of the reasons that we wanted to bring all of these people together is that a lot of the time we hear a lot of really bad news about salmon. And I think that, you know, you see those and you see that bad news in a lot of these graphs and we'll get into that a little bit. But the, the unifying theme here tonight is that there are people working really hard to turn this around. And I wanted you guys to see the, 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 inside, um, the, the inside machinery here from scientists to, you know, to, to people in the nonprofit world who are, are working really hard for many, many years um, to, to try to, to get things to turn around, to try to get those graphs going back up. And there's a lot of brains you can see behind this and a lot of heart. Um, and so thank you all, all of you speakers for, for sharing a little bit of your, um, your intellect and also your, your passion and your heart for these, um, these animals. And um, and for people too, and the future of, of our ecosystem. So I hope everybody got um, something out of this and I'm, I'm really excited to hear what questions pop up. I also have some questions that we have from the fifth graders who have been studying salmon. Um, and so I'll pepper those in here once in a while. But what I'd like to invite everybody to do now is turn on your screens if you're comfortable with that so we can see you. And also um, we'll, we'll start calling on people. If you want to, you can go, if you can either use the chat to type in your question, or you can go to the little reactions button down at the bottom of the um, toolbar. And there's a little place where it says raise hand and you can raise your hand and we can call on you that way too. So um, Wendy and I will be looking in both, both places to, um, <laughs> to call on people. So. Let me see. Um, okay. um, Bianca, there were a few people who typed their questions as people were speaking. So how about if we start there? Does that, that sound good? Great. Yeah, do um, you wanna grab those? Mark, yeah, Mark Nasuti. I'm probably saying your name wrong. So once you're called on, you can unmute and ask your question if you'd like. Is Mark still around? Uh, I have a... Uh, uh, some comments, uh, if you do uh, hear me, please. Yep. Uh, uh, and my name is Einar Svensson. Okay. I am a I'm a sport fisherman. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Einar. I, I'm wondering. Um, we were just about to ask somebody else a question, so could we have you go next? Uh, no. Um, uh, I, I like to bring up uh, some very important subject you know, that you haven't got into. Okay. A few, a few years ago, the University of Washington, together with NOAA, uh, did um, uh, have a, they had a pond inside the University of Washington and they let uh, small fish, they followed it uh, uh, together with um, research ship by NOAA showing that uh, the salmon has an incredible long cycle lasting up to four years before it's returning to Puget Sound. Now, I don't know if you ever go into this part of it, but um, I happen to meet a fisherman in Tokyo, a Japanese one, who admitted that they will go out and catch the salmon halfway. In other words, uh, uh, it's only two years old instead of four years old. And that is part of a, uh, my concern 
that one of the reason there is so little salmon returning to Puget Sound from this long cycle may be because Asians are involved in catching it uh, halfway. Now, um, as far as the cycle is concerned, uh, the uh, University of Washington together with NIA, Minoa came back with maps showing that it's not just one single cycle, but uh, uh, a number of uh, routes, you might say. And I think that um, this cycle is of such importance that we should really stress it. And we didn't bring it up tonight. Great, thank you, Einar. We can, we can address that a little bit if anybody um, has anything to say about that on the speaker panel. I know nobody, Joseph, you might know a little bit, but maybe just that overall question of um, how much pressure is coming from fishing compared to these other things? And is that something that we need to be worried about um, in, terms of, um, in terms of salmon populations? Just a quick response, it, it, Bianca, you, you said it, I think, earlier, these fish move through a bunch of different ecosystems and, and they face a bunch of different challenges. Uh, fishing is one cause of mortality. You know, everything I've seen in, in my area of expertise is mainly Columbia Basin stocks, is that the, the harvest pressures on salmon stocks, you know, in the last century, were much more substantial, and and that to you know today those pressures have been um, you know ratcheted way back, and in in you know sort of in the overall scheme of things, I think mortality associated human caused mortality associated with harvest is sort of on the on the order of you know zero to ten to twelve percent, um, and you know that's not true of all fish in the ocean, of course, because there is clearly some some overfishing issues, but I think for salmon. My view is that that you know yes they're harvested those harvests are managed pretty well uh, and and you know there's much greater causes of decline which the ones we've been talking about today habitat connectivity um, ability to reach spawning grounds and and complete their life cycle and so forth. Okay, thank you, Joseph. Is there anybody else on the um, panel that wants to add anything? And we'll go go to the next question. Okay. So let's see, Did, should we go back to Mark's question? He says, how do we mitigate stormwater runoff here on Vashon? Let's just um, take his question and, and run with it. Um, so let's have maybe Chelsea or um, Stephanie answer that. What, what do you guys think? What, uh, Chelsea, were you the one that just visited? <laughs> Yeah, I just was, yeah. yeah. So um, you guys are you guys are pretty lucky on Vashon with a lot of still a lot of remaining pervious landscapes. If you if you remember our talk uh, left, but there's a lot of um, a, a good thing to do is kind of think about what your local micro watershed is. Like think about your home and where the water moves from. Uh, you know your roof from your driveway on your street. Where is that ending up? Um, and you can you can do things even on your own property to help mitigate stormwater. I mentioned cisterns and rain barrels are a very um, low cost and an easy way to to trap stormwater. If you've got stormwater coming off your roof that maybe runs off your driveway and into the street and and will end up in going out a stormwater outfall, um, you can mitigate some of that runoff by by collecting some of that water in a cistern and using it during the summer to water your plants. Um, that's a that's an easy implementation. If you've got a little more space, um, you might think about installing a rain garden. Um, I'm not sure if Vashon is under the, the purview of the 12,000 rain gardens project, but if you live on Vashon and you're interested in maybe having some green infrastructure on your property, the 12,000 rain gardens, I, I'll, I'll throw a link in the chat after this. Um, but it's a program that helps uh, give basically like rebates for people that want to install rain gardens on their own property. So it really helps deal with that issue of we need a lot of this infrastructure across the landscape in order to really deal with mitigating stormwater. Um, and then things like uh, being very mindful about 
you know, whether you change your oil in your driveway or, you know, on your lawn or something, you know, like thing, thinking about um, ways that you might be transmitting some of these uh, stormwater pollutants um, directly onto, onto road surfaces. Um, so I can throw a couple of resources that might be useful into the chat after this. Um, but I don't know if that helped answer your question at all, Mark, but let me know. Thanks, Chelsea. Um, so I'm going to do one question from the fifth graders and then I, and then Michael, Lori, you can go next. I see your hands up. Um, so let me just throw this one out here. Um, you know, we've ha we have uh, been looking at all these graphs about, you know, declining salmon and we saw with Tessa um, only four Chinook, I think, in, in her um, seining nets um, when she was looking at the, the maximum that they were getting. And so one of, the, one of the students was asking, how do they count the amount of salmon to see if they are extinct? And so I'm wondering if Tessa, you could just say how you're counting and then maybe Joseph, you know, what goes, how do they count all of those salmon on the, on the Columbia River? And how do they know there were only 14 sockeye that came back? So Tessa, why don't you start? Yeah, I'm glad that that was asked because I think it's really important to put our methods in context. So we are throwing, we're throwing a net in the water to a pretty small piece of the ocean, <laughs> a pretty small net, and we're dragging it in and we're counting how many fish. And that, that four Chinook was an average, like an average for every net pull that we took. So you know, every time you jump, you think about every time you jump into the water with a snorkel, you're not going to see Chinook salmon right away, right? They're, they're distributed over the landscape very unevenly. We found that Chinook don't tend to school as much as chum. We might throw a net over and catch 50 juvenile chum. And so like we have to put that for Chinook in context uh, of their biology. They're juvenile fish, they're spread out all over the place the ocean is huge, our chances of catching one with a net are pretty low. So I would never use our little Lampara net surveys as a way of estimating population trends over time. I could use it to estimate how many fish are in front of that shoreline over time, maybe according to my methods, but the better way and the way that they, you know, the most, a better way of measuring trends through time is by looking at adults where they funnel into really small spaces like the rivers and streams where they return to spawn and you can count them more reliably. Um, but I'm sure Joseph will be happy to expand on that. Uh, you know, there's a lot, I think about, again, Columbia snakefish, some of the most studied critters on the planet. And, and that includes counting and, and they get counted on the harvest side when fishermen come in and, and you know, numbers of, 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 of fish are counted that way. They're also counted as they go through each dam. They've got core employees looking through windows that can see the fish swimming through and they, they're, you know, they're sort of will, will work for weeks on end counting, sort of trying to count every fish that goes through and what species it is. And of course, they're, they're less and less as you go further up into the system. Um, then you've got, you know, those sockeye that were counted, you know, those are fish, those are amazing fish. They're like Olympians, right? They, they have to travel 900 miles to get back to their spawning grounds through these reservoirs, up through these rivers. They climb over 6,000 feet in elevation to get back to their, their, their spawning lakes in the Stanley Basin. Uh, they, th those particular fish get counted as they, just as Tessa suggested, as they sort of enter the lake, they get caught in these weirs that are holding pat, holding boxes for them. So they can actually, individual fish are getting sort of counted in, in that way. So lots of different systems to try to account for, uh, you know, sort of overall, uh, you know, population in a given year and then trends over time. Those are just some examples. Great, Thank, thanks Joseph. So I'm going to call on Michael next. We're we're already at 8:30, believe it or not. So um, let's have let's take Michael's question. And if you have a question you'd like to be answered, uh, and you want to put it in the chat, um, if any of the panelists want to monitor the chat, and if it's, there's a question that you think you can answer over chat, go for it while while we're listening to to Michael, and then we can save the chat and email it out to people if we need to. Um, 
Okay, so Michael, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, okay, well, two things. One is um, my wife and I, Diane, have have gotten money uh, through the, from King County to help people address their stormwater issues on their property if you're connected to the uh, sewer uh, system on Vashon. So, uh, and we still have a little bit of budget left for that. So, uh, you know, maybe I'll put my email in the chat. But my real question, and it's more than a question, um, I, you know, I totally support everything that Joseph was saying on the bigger picture fish. But, uh, you know, when I lived on in Sylvan Beach and one morning I opened the drapes and looked out and saw like about six fishing boats right there in Colvos Passage. And it was just this massive amount of fishing. And uh, I just wondered, I've always wondered since then, how can very many fish make it through that gauntlet over to Shingle Mill Creek? At, because there's so many boats and nets there catching them. You know, and since then, uh, and I'm trying not to ramble here too much. I try to keep this short. Uh, I, I did talk to uh, someone at King County and at the Washington State Fish and Wildlife, and they told me that they set the fishing regulations, you know, for Puget Sound area, for the inner sound, based on returns to the big rivers. They pay absolutely zero attention to the returns of this on the streams in, in, on Vashon. And so I guess if I want to turn that into a question, my question or recommendation is that we should put major pressure on fish and wildlife to include the small numbers of salmon returning to the streams on Vashon and to have that play a role in the fishing regulations, at least for the fishing, especially commercial around Vashon Island. Uh, so there it is. I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that. Yeah. Okay. And I, I guess I, I did state I was a sports fisherman. And uh, there are three of us, we share a boat together. Last year, we caught no salmon in the Puget Sound area around Vashon just to make you aware of how bad it is. Okay, th thanks you guys. Thanks for bringing that up. And it, you know, I'm, it, I don't know if anybody on the panel has um, anything more to say about fishing. It sounds like the, the issue here is there's a larger picture where it's, you know, about 10 to 12% of the, um, of the impact on salmon is fishing, but maybe in local smaller streams, we're kind of missing the, um, missing the boat there and they're getting more impacted. I, I'll see if I can try to find um, this article that uh, and I was trying to find it while you were asking your question, Michael, about indigenous fishing practices that are tied to local streams and how there are certain, I don't know if any of the panelists read this article, but um, possibly if Angela was here, she would know about it. So I could I can ask her, but um, looking at monitoring those local streams and adjusting fishing pressures locally in those marine waters around the streams um, to accommodate that and increase that that diversity of um, um, different fishing runs. Um, so I'll see if I can find that and, and pass it out to people. All right, so maybe let's take um, one more question and then we'll wrap up for the night. And we have all of the um, panelists emails. So if they're okay with it, if you have a burning question that we didn't get to uh, and you want to email these people, I could probably pass it along for you. So um, is there anybody else that I missed in chat? Um, Have you been looking here? Oh, that was a question from a fifth grader. Anybody want to take a stab at that one? 
can you repeat the question, Bianca? Oh, sorry. Did I did I hitch up for a little bit there? Yes. Um, there is a fifth grader question. Do salmon get thirsty? <laughs> I started to answer that in the chat, Steph, but you might do a little better than me. Yeah, so I was just um, responding in the chat there that yes, when salmon get to the salt water, they get very thirsty because the um, seawater is saltier than their bodies. So they're losing water through the gills by osmosis. So to replace that water, they have to drink a lot and then their bodies purge out the extra salts through their urine. And their gills also do a lot of work transporting ions to help maintain that balance. So yes, they do get thirsty. Awesome. I will just add, if I can, you know, the, 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 it's always fascinated me that these fish can go from freshwater uh, where they're trying to keep water out, I think, to salt water where the whole, the whole dynamic for them biologically is totally the opposite. And somehow they make that that transition, and then of course do it one more time coming back home. It, it's um, uh, it's astonishing. Yes, really is. These are amazing, amazing animals, and just to think of all of that they traverse in in their life, it's pretty overwhelming to think about and pretty amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. This has been wonderful, and. Um, Thanks for coming. Thanks for attending. Um, thanks to our partners. Thanks to the speakers for pouring your hearts and brains out here. It was great. Um, and Wendy, do you have anything else to add before we sign off for the night? No, just to thank everybody again and to thank our, our uh, the Rose Foundation for um, funding this talk. Yeah, great. Well, thanks everybody. And we have it recorded and we'll see if we can save this chat too. So we have that as well before we go. So thanks everybody and have a wonderful night. Thank you very much speakers. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Have a great night. Super okay. fun. Have a good one. Bye. Thanks. Take care everybody.